Hi everyone, I'm Benjamin from Reporters Without Borders. This is our digital security training and today we will talk about two-factor authentication. You may have already heard of the thing called two-factor authentication, but do you know what it is, how it works and if there is more than one flavor? All of this and everything you need to know about when it does and when it doesn't protect you is what I want to show you in this video. I will show you the four most important flavors of two-factor authentication and explain to you how they work. We discuss how they protect you against hackers and which one is more secure than the other. We will also study how hackers will still try to attack you and what do you need to know in order to prepare for their attacks. I will also give you a few practical recommendations for your day-to-day -day use. Two-factor authentication means that you need two things in order to log into your account. Let's say you want to draw money from an ATM. First, you have to insert your banking card, and then you have to enter your PIN number. You need both your banking card and your PIN number. When we call your PIN number one factor and your banking card another factor, we have two factors, hence two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication also works with your online accounts. One factor will be your password. The other factor can be your smartphone, for example, or a special USB fab. And a login to your online account could look something like this. It all depends on the website, what can be a second factor, and many websites offer more than one option. We won't discuss every possible option out there, but I want to explain to you how the most important ones work and what you have to know about them in order to use them securely. Before we continue talking about your options, you probably wonder, do you really need one? Even if you have a secure password and use a password manager, why is that not good enough? First of all, do you really use a password manager for every one of your accounts? Let's be realistic. Sometimes you have good reasons not to use a password manager for a particular account. And maybe this password is also not as strong as it could be. But while two-factor authentication can and should not replace a strong password, it is especially useful wherever you do not use one. The other reason is that two-factor authentication can protect you against phishing attacks. In a phishing attack, an attacker sets up a web page that looks very similar or exactly like the login page to one of your accounts, say, Facebook. Then your attackers try to make you enter your password into the login page, for example, by sending you an email. Once they have your username and password, they can do anything they want with your account. Not every two-factor authentication solution will protect you against every type of phishing attack, and we will see which one will do best in this video. But phishing attacks are such an important attack scenario that we will do a separate video about them, so stay tuned. Now, let's talk about how two-factor authentication works online. I will explain to you the four most important flavors, U2F hardware tokens, authenticator apps, as well as notification prompts and SMS. So-called universal second factor, short, U2F tokens are to date the most form secure of two-factor authentication. And they look like this. Before I explain to you how they work in the background, let's have a look at how to use them. After you enter your username and password on a website, your browser will ask you to enter a USB token into your computer and then to press a button. That's it. Some tokens also work wirelessly and you have to put them on your phone in order to finish logging in. Now, let's have a look at how they work in the background. When you first register the token at a website, the token and the website will exchange some information. The token will register the URL of the website and will create two numbers, or better, cryptographic keys. One secret key and one public key. The token will give the public key to the website and will keep the secret key to itself. The secret key will never leave the token. Both keys together, the secret and the public key, allow this token and the website to use something that is called a digital or cryptographic signature. A cryptographic signature works similar to a handwritten signature. If you provide someone with a document that has your handwritten signature on it, it should be easy for them to verify that you have signed this document but it should be impossible for anyone else to forge your signature on your document that you did not sign. A cryptographic signature does the similar thing, just for data. The secret key inside the token allows the token create such a signature, while the public key allows the website to verify that the signature was made by the token. Now, let's see how your token and the website work together when you log in. When you log in at a website, the website will tell your web browser that it has the public key of a token on record and that it wants to talk to it. It will then send some random information to the browser, which will take this information together with the URL and will send it to your token. Your token will then wait until you push its button. 
When you do, it will use the URL to select the secret key that it created before and uses that to create a signature on the information it just received by your browser. It will then send the signature back to your browser, who will in turn send it back to the website. Finally, the website will use the public number it has stored for your account to verify the signature. And if it is correct, you are allowed to log in. This is the general idea of how U2F tokens work. Some of them might work slightly different, but they all share the same idea. So how secure are they? Let's first have a look at what happens when hackers steal the information on the website. In our video on password security, we called this a password database breach. Let's suppose hackers manage to steal everything that is stored on the website. The only thing they get is, besides your password information, the public key of your token. But having the public key is only enough to verify a signature. In order to create one, they would need the private key, which is inside your token, which is not stored on the website. But now, let's see what happens when hackers mount a phishing attack on you. In a phishing attack, hackers trick you to enter your password on a page that is under their control. This step still works with U2F tokens, so hackers will get your password. But the important step comes next. In order to use your password to log in, your hackers still need a signature of your token, but a phishing page, no matter how close the page or the URL look compared to the original, will most of the time have a different URL than the original. And while we humans are very susceptible to misidentify similar looking URLs, your browser and your token will verify the URL character by character for you. In the end, your token will not create a signature, which means your head hacker will not get a signature, which means they cannot log in. The chance that hackers will crack the cryptographic signature is rather slim, and the most practical thing hackers still can do is to hack your computer, the website, or the internet. All of this is not impossible, of course, but these are entirely different attack scenarios, and we will talk some other time on how we can protect us against them. Sometimes it is also the job of others to protect us against these attacks. For example, in 2018, researchers found two vulnerabilities for U2F tokens, one in Bluetooth U2F devices and one in the Google Chrome web browser. Google was quick to fix those problems and replaced all affected U2F tokens. I generally recommend to use U2F tokens when you can afford one. This brings me to the only downsides that I can think of. U2F tokens do cost some money and probably not everyone can afford to buy one. The second one is that you have to keep an eye on your token. You may not use it every day and someone might be able to steal and replace it without you even noticing. So if you have adversaries that might be able to pull this off, the next option that we will talk about, authenticator apps, might be a better alternative. Instead of using a separate device, authenticator apps make use of your smartphone. Let's see how they work. When you log in to, say, your Google account, the Google page wants you to enter a short code. In order to get this code, you have to open an app on your phone, which generates that code for you. And this is how it works in the background. When you activate two-factor authentication for an authenticator app, Google will show you a QR code that you have to scan with your authenticator app. This picture contains a secret number that has now installed the app. Google also keeps a copy of the secret number. When you open your authenticator app, the app takes the secret number and the current time and mixes that together with a so-called hash function. The result of this will be a very long number and the app cuts off a large chunk so that there's only a smaller one left. When you give this code to Google, Google does the same calculation and compares your code to the code Google has calculated. If both numbers match, you are allowed to log in. If you keep an authenticator app open for some time, you will notice that the code will change every now and then. How often depends on the app and the website, but it is about every 30 seconds. This calculation that I just explained to you is called time-based one-time password. This is kind of an industry standard, and while there are multiple different authenticator apps, for example the Google or Microsoft authenticators, most of them work this way. So, how secure is that? Well, the hashing calculation is very similar to the one we talked about in a password security video. If you haven't seen the video, one of the takeaways is that by using this calculation, no one can find out the secret value just by looking at the output. And without having the secret value, it is impossible to calculate a code for the current time. The best an attacker can do is to guess it randomly, and, well, the chance to find the code this way is rather slim. Now, let's see how authenticator apps hold up against phishing attacks. When hackers set up a fake login page and collect your password, 
The password alone is not enough to get into your account. They still need the code from your Authenticator app. They could also grab your code, yes, but these codes only work for a short time, so they would have to log into your account as soon as you typed in your password. And believe it or not, this makes things more difficult for attackers, especially when they are criminally motivated and want to collect the login credentials from more people than just you. However, while it is more difficult to break into your account when you use an authenticator app, it is not entirely impossible. I will show you how these advanced phishing attacks work at the end of this video and what you can do to defend yourself against them. But for now, let's say authenticator apps offer you limited protection against phishing attacks. Now, let's have a look at what happens when your attacker steal your login information from a website. If you remember, your authenticator app uses a secret number to generate a code for you. The website also needs that number to verify that your code is correct. When hackers are lucky, they can get these codes the same way they can steal your password information on websites, by a password database breach. But while your passwords are protected in that they are assaulted and hashed, your authenticator app secret cannot be protected this way. The server needs to know it in plain text because it has to do the same kind of calculation that your authenticator app does. Knowing your password and authenticator secret, your attacker can log into your account on this website, so authenticator apps do not protect you here. They can, however, protect you if you use the same password on a different website, if you also use an authenticator app there. Note that this does not mean that it is okay to use the same password on multiple websites. This only means that I understand that you may still choose to do so. In conclusion, authenticator apps offer you some limited protection against phishing and database breaches. They are not as secure as U2F tokens, but on the upside, authenticator apps do not cost any money and you can start to use one right now. The two methods that we have seen so far both work offline. Neither your U2F token nor your smartphone have to be connected to the internet or the mobile network. For the methods that I will show you next, your phone must be online. The first method that I want to show you are notification prompts. When using a notification prompt, every time you log in to say your Facebook account, Facebook will send your phone a message asking if it is you that is trying to log in. You can decide to say this was me or not, and only if you decide this was me, you are allowed to log in. When anyone else has your password and is trying to log into your account, you get the same kind of message. As long as you do not approve, your attacker cannot log in. You can get these messages either by SMS or using a separate app on your phone. Not every website supports both, so your options are dependent on the choices that the website made. A separate app is in general more secure than SMS, since the communication between your phone and the website is then properly encrypted. Since a few years, experts even recommend not using SMS anymore. I will explain to you why that is later. In any case, the weakest point in notification prompts appear to be us, the users. We humans get easily used to approve any kind of notification we receive on our phones, that we almost automatically tap the approve button. But let's see how notification prompts help you against phishing attacks. When you enter your password at a phishing page, the attacker has to immediately use your password and try to log into your account. Otherwise, you would probably not approve the login. Such an attack is similar to the one we discussed for authenticator apps, but it is a bit easier to do. Notification prompts do, however, help very well against password database breaches. It all depends on the details of the implementation, of course, but you can assume that adversaries cannot steal anything from the website that allows them to bypass notification prompts. In conclusion, while notification prompts do offer limited protection against phishing attacks, they do protect you against password database breaches. The only major downside that I can think of is that your phone has to be online in some way, and that you have to pay attention not to approve any notification prompt by accident. In a slight variation of notification prompts, a website will send your phone a notification or SMS that contains a short code. Instead of approving the login at your phone, you have to type in this code at the website. If you did not type the code within a short time frame, the website will invalidate this code. In my opinion, the major benefit of this method is that it is less likely that you approve a login accidentally. This is also the reason I myself prefer this variation compared to notification prompts. As protection against password database breaches, this method should be as secure as regular notification prompts if the website implemented everything correctly. Regarding to phishing attacks, 
However, this variation has the same limitation as authenticated wraps. They protect you against some form of phishing attacks, but not so well against more sophisticated ones. Before I explain to you how these more sophisticated attacks work, I want to tell you about two practical things that you should know before you activate two-factor authentication for your accounts. The first one is that when you have enabled two-factor authentication, you really do need your second factor in order to access your account. This means that if you lose your phone or hardware token or if it breaks or someone takes it away, you lose also access to your account. But no worry, you can prepare for this. One option is to have more than one second factor for your account. Most websites allow you to register more than one and for example Google's advanced protection program even requires you to have two UDF authenticator tokens. If you have two tokens, you can store one at a safe place while you take the other one with you. Some websites will also generate a list of one-time passwords for you when you register a token or authenticator app. You can use those as a backup method. And the second thing is that if you use a password manager, you should make sure that you use it on a different device than your authenticator app. But some password managers allow you to store authenticator secrets directly in the password manager. Storing them on a different device makes it way more difficult for hackers to get both at the same time. The two last things that I want to show to you today are a little bit of background on advanced phishing attacks that directly target two-factor authentication. The first attack method are man-in-the-middle phishing attacks. When hackers set up a phishing page to circumvent two-factor authentication, they can use tools called a reverse proxy, for example Moorina or Modlishka. These tools sit between you and the original web page, read everything you send and give you a perfect copy of the original page. Since the attacker sits in between you and the original page, this is also called a man-in-the-middle attack. Now, when you enter your login name, password on and authenticator code, your attackers sit in between you and the original page and can just take over your entire login session. Even when you log out, they can send you a fake logout page and can keep themselves logged in. The second attack method that I want to tell you about is related to SMS messages. First of all, if, if your adversary is your government, then, well, your government can read your SMS messages. They just have to tell your mobile provider to hand them over. They can also make SMS not reach your phone, send them to a different phone number, etc. Let's be clear about that. If your adversary is your government, SMS-based two-factor authentication will not protect you. Period. But even if your adversary is not your government, they can still manage to read your SMS messages if they really want to. A very sneaky method that has been used by criminals in the past is by hacking the telephone network that delivers your SMS messages to you. When you think about it, everyone in the world can send everyone else an SMS message. So all the telephones in the world must somehow be interconnected, don't they? Connecting your phone to this network is the task of your mobile provider. And your mobile provider connects to every other mobile provider through a network that is called SS7. I'll spare you all the technical details, but in a nutshell, back in the day when the SS7 network was built, the engineers assumed that everyone in this network is a trustworthy person that, could, that would never attempt to do anything bad. Well, you probably know where this is going. For starters, we can reasonably assume that police and intelligence agencies all over the world have access to this network. So there's that. But there's more. In recent years, companies started selling access to this network for little money and little to no oversight. It didn't take long until the criminals started to buy access as well. So, what can someone with access to this network do? A lot. Read your SMS, send and receive SMS in your name, making phone calls on behalf of you, etc. etc. The good news is, mobile operators are working hard to fix all the flaws and to improve the security. The bad news is, this will take a while. And there's yet another trend among cyber criminals to read your SMS. This trend is called SIM swapping. What they do is to just call your mobile operator or visit one of their shops, claiming to be you and telling them they need another SIM card because the original was lost. When they have your replacement SIM card, they can read your SMS. An attacker can also trick you into installing software on your phone that can read your SMS. When was the last time you checked which app has permission to read your SMS? I knew it. And you're not alone. Research has shown us that all of us are incredibly overwhelmed with all the permissions on our phones that we have to manage. Having said all of this, if you do not have any other method available, 
SMS is still a good thing to use for two-factor authentication. Any kind of two-factor authentication will improve the security of your account, even if it is SMS. This is all I want to tell you right now about two-factor authentication, but don't worry if you come across other approaches, such as email and other terms, such as two-step verification. Companies sometimes offer different methods and use different names for the same thing. And while two-step verification and two-factor authentication are technically a different thing, you shouldn't be worried about that for all practical purposes. Secure passwords, password managers and two-factor authentication are the most basic steps you can take to make your online accounts more secure. Beyond that, we have to discuss in more detail how attackers work and will try to attack you. My name is Benjamin, this was Reporters Without Borders Digital Security Training. See you next time.